give her testimony this evening about the Lord's goodness. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much. It is indeed a privilege to be here this evening to see your faces. You'll never know how this has encouraged me. I came to speak to you, but you have encouraged me so greatly, and I'm so thankful for that. You know, uh, there are many stories I can tell about Kendall Wiley. Uh, <laughs> some of them are too private to be told. Uh, he had a talk with my husband about a year before he got married, and he told Kendall some things he needed to hear, didn't he, Kendall? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> he sure did, but he loved Kendall. And you know, it's a wonderful thing for me to be back in Canada. It's been many years. The last time my husband and I were here, we were with Brother Kendall and Arlene. And I'm glad we to be here just to say a few words about my precious husband. I could not have been married to a more wonderful man. A man that loved God and was totally sold out for the Lord. Someone said to me this morning, your husband was really strong. I said, yes, he was. He was a bulldog. And she said he trained so many strong men to stand by his side. And he did. And it has been such a blessing to me to see all of you crown graduates that are here. And to hear you preach with such fervor. I know he was watching. There's no doubt in my mind. He never missed anything. And I know that he didn't miss this. And I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be here. Last night, I had the privilege to talk to some of the Crown grads, and we laughed. It was the first time I laughed since my best moment home. But to hear them share their precious memories about my husband, thrilled to myself. Men and straighten it out, aren't you? So they assured me they were. If they don't, my husband will come back to get you. So I know you're going to do exactly what you need to do. You know, uh, one of our dearest friends, Johnny, is here. And he started telling a little bit of the story last night, but we have known Johnny and Barbara for 50 years. Is that right, Johnny? We've known you that long. And we first met them when they were on their honeymoon. Now, most of you know that my husband pastored Southern Baptist churches for the first seven and a half years of his ministry. And he decided to go to Dallas, Texas to uh, the, the meeting of the Southern Baptist. And when he went there, uh, I didn't go, the boys were very small. I went on the trip with him, but I didn't go to the meetings that he was in. And he came back to the hotel and he said, Honey, this is not right. They're, they're not taking the right stand on the Bible, and I don't to want to invest my life. And he began to say, Honey, I really believe God wants us to become an independent Baptist. Well, I had no idea what an independent Baptist was. I'd never seen one before. So he had to educate me to what an independent Baptist was. He was pastoring his second church, Calvary Baptist Church in the North City. Wonderful. We have had wonderful, wonderful pastors. I think there were people at his memorial service from every church that he had pastored. But at that present time, we were at Calvary Baptist Church in the North City. And so he said to me, honey, there's this young preacher that's preaching over in Solway Baptist Church in Knoxville. And I want us to go over there and hear him preach. He's an independent Baptist. I said, okay. God gave me to him to be a helping, so I was going to stand by his side. I thought I'd try this thing out. I had been a Southern Baptist all my life. My father was a Southern Baptist preacher. That's all I'd ever known. Like Johnny said, I was in church nine months before I was born. And so we were on their honeymoon. And so they introduced Johnny, and he got up to preach. He preached a while. And then he did the most amazing thing. Now, he denies this. The only time he's ever going to admit it is when he's in heaven. But Johnny got up and was preaching, and he got so happy he started running the pews. He walked every pew on this side all the way down to the back. I thought, Lord, protect this man. <laughs> so all the way to the back, he started on this side and came all the way forward. I could not believe it. Then he got back up here on the platform, and it was absolutely amazing. Now, I did not remember his message. All I remember is what he did that night. <laughs> so we got in the car. We sat down, and I looked over at my husband, and I said, and this is what you want us to be? <laughs> <laughs> but I am so thankful for the friendship with Johnny and Barb that we've had for 50 years. Matter of fact, that was their 
honeymoon, and they came to my husband's memorial service celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. They've been dear, dear friends. I think about when uh, we were privileged to be here with Leroy and Arlene the last time we were in Canada, and what a wonderful time we had. And my husband actually fought to get here because he was so proud of what Kendall was doing. You know, I remember the summer that Kendall came with a singing group to Canada, and uh, we got this <laughs> astounding phone call. He had met some girl up here, and we just couldn't believe it. We were so excited for him, and it didn't take long for God to put Jessica into Kendall's life, and he has used them greatly. I'm so excited about what God has done in Kendall's life. Did I ever expect it? No. I never expected it. <laughs> You know, my husband and I have always joked with Kendall, and he does that with people that he loves dearly. And so Kendall's really able to take that. And then after he gave Kendall a lot, he gave him two precious little girls that are so beautiful. Now, God never makes any mistakes. And when Kendall asked me to speak about my husband, I just thought there was a few things that I'd tell you. We met when I was 13 years old. He was 14. We were both freshmen in high school. And from the first day I ever saw him, I fell in love with him. Matter of fact, one day, we were I was riding down the street with one of my friends in our hometown of Memphis, Tennessee. And I said to my friend, I said, you see that boy walking down the street right there? I'm going to marry him. Huh. And he says he didn't have a chance after that. That was really important. <laughs> I, I could tell you the story of how we got married, but it's a little bit embarrassing. Uh, we tried to keep it from the Crown College students for a while, but after a while we just gave up. Oh, we got married when we were 17, 19 years old. And he loved to tell that story. Matter of fact, I was listening to him at a couple's retreat that we had recorded to listen to it on YouTube. And he was talking about when we got married. So he and I decided we were going to get married. Of course, we asked my mother, and my father, of course, was deceased. My mom gave us permission. She loved my husband from the get go. So she gave us permission to go get married. So we headed off. We laid out of school. This was our senior year. And we laid out of school that day. And we went to get married. When we got there, it was bad because the Justice of Peace said, I'll have to see your identification. So we showed him our driver's license. He looked at my husband's and it was okay. He looked at mine and he said, Oh, honey, I'm sorry, you're not old enough. You have to be 18 to be married. And I was only 17 years old. So we were so discouraged. Now this was after we'd gotten our blood test. 57 years ago, you had to have a blood test, believe it or not, before you could get married. And that was another funny thing. I was horrified to have my blood taken. I had never had my blood taken. Well, he was going to be the big E-man and get his taken. So he stepped up first, passed out cold. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we were disheartened because I wasn't old enough to get married. So he got this brilliant idea. This was back when your driver's license were paid for. And I was born in 1949. And for me to be married, I had to be born in 1948. So we went back home and we told Mama it didn't work. We couldn't get married. So he took my driver's license. I probably from the look on some of your faces, I maybe should be telling this. <laughs> he took my driver's license and changed it from 1949 to 1948. Now this was how stupid we were. We went back to the very same man. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, I see you're back today. And I said, yes. And he said, well, I need you to see your identification. So my husband showed him yes. He looked at mine and he said, oh, I see you're old enough today. <laughs> <laughs> so he married us. I often wondered if we were have a great relationship. So 57 years serving the Lord together. The next summer in July, we had an area wide revival meeting, and my husband and I attended each and every night. And the Lord began to deal with his heart about preaching. And my father had been a Baptist preacher who was killed when I was five years old, so I was very open to my husband becoming a preacher. But one night during that meeting, he went through and surrendered his life to preach the gospel. He had always been an outstanding Christian ever since I had known him, but he totally gave his life, surrendered everything he had that night at that meeting to preach the gospel. And our lives 
must begin again. And that was over 57 years ago. And what a journey that we had together. During our ministry together, I saw God establish many wonderful things. Of course, preach from Crown College. Because you preach with faith. Hey, Dad, you preach like he preached. And I'm so thankful that you're so strong. And please, please continue. I think a lot of you have been out of college for 10 to 12 years and you're still going strong. And how grateful I am for that. And then to see you young people stand up here and say, my heart was so thrilled when my husband decided that it was what God wanted to build a Christian college. We were still in Patterson, New Jersey. That was another story. He really hated to leave Patterson, New Jersey because he loved the people. There were only two Baptist churches in Patterson, New Jersey. And when the pulpit committee from the Temple Baptist Church started dealing with him, he said, honey, there's 320 Baptist churches in Knoxville. Why on earth would God ever want me to go back to Knoxville, Tennessee? And I said, I don't know the Baptist church that we almost put those people before God's will. Uh, the pulpit committee kept calling him, and he would say, no, it's not the Lord's will for me to come. Well, God threw him in the hospital, and when he was in the hospital, I'll never forget it. He said, okay, Lord, if that's what you want me to do, I'll go. But he loved those people so much. And on the way to church on Sunday night, he said, Honey, if God will give me the strength to get up before these people and resign, I'll know it's his way to go to Tennessee. So he preached. And when he finished preaching that night, he told the people, It's God's will for me to go to the Temple Baptist Church in Powell, Tennessee. There's lots of crying that night, lots of tears. Matter of fact, our clothes, the shoulders on our clothes were soaked with tears. That was the love the people had for him. And he so often told the story about how the chairman of the deacons, whom he had led to the Lord, got as much as we were. And they did. They have. They've been wonderful. And I want you to know that the Temple Baptist Church is still taking care of me. And they're precious to me. And I love them dearly. And they could not have been better to me. But throughout our 57 years, I have been privileged, like I said, to see so many things established. And foremost, it's Crown College. That was the love of his heart. He tried to do it in New Jersey, but everything was so expensive. And they weren't interested in a Baptist starting a Christian college in New Jersey. And I think that's one reason God led us to Powell. And he told the church, when they voted to make him pastor, that they were voting to establish a Christian college. And they knew that from the very beginning. They were very happy about that. The church was always excited about Crown College. We had church members that sold their house and got the profit from it to establish Crown College. Our church has accepted Crown College. The students see all these graduates and then these current students here has just blessed my heart to see me. When my husband was taken to the hospital on September the 4th, it was one day after he had preached his last sermon at the temple. He was very weak on September the 3rd, and uh, he really couldn't even button his shirt. He was so weak. And I said, honey, you can't go to church today. You're just too weak to go. He said, honey, God has given me a message, and I'm going to go. And so he did. On September the 3rd, he went to church, and he preached the last message that he would ever preach. And I feel like when he came home that Sunday morning after he had preached, he knew that he would never be back inside the Temple Baptist Church. We prayed that God was going to raise him up. The church prayed. And we all believed. Emily and Brandon were there with me. We all believed that God was going to raise him up. The church believed. He'd done it three times before. And he would do it this time. But when my husband went into the hospital, he was walking, talking, eating, having meetings. He was himself. And that was one reason I felt like God was going to heal him. But they began to have to do surgeries on my husband. And by the way, my husband had 20 surgeries while he pastored the Temple Baptist Church in the 35 years he was there. He had nine spine surgeries. And after every spine surgery, he came back stronger more willing and ready to get back to work for the Lord Jesus Christ. But they put 
put him to sleep in this hospital six times, and they used the drug fentanyl. Now, you know what kids are doing with fentanyl today? They're killing themselves on the street, dying dangerously. Now, that was very difficult for me to hear. And when they told us that, my son took out his phone and showed them how my husband had preached on September the 3rd. This was before, of course, he had to get those surgery. And this neurologist said, if you had not shown me that video of your father preaching, I would never believe what you're saying because of the acquired brain damage that had been done to him. Nonetheless, I have to accept that it's God's will. A prayer I have request for you is that I would never become bitter because God took the most precious thing in the world that I had. I know His will is perfect, but sometimes it's a whole lot easier to preach it than it is to practice it. So on December the 12th, 2023, my precious husband went home to be with the Lord. My life works has been for years, ever since we were at Tennessee Temple serving with Dr. Burgess, Romans 8, 28. And my husband always liked to say, you don't leave off. And we know that all things, all things work together for good. To them who love the Lord, to them who are the call according to his purpose. And many times I've said, this took for it. This going to work together for my good. If I believe for the God, it will work together for my good. My husband was a great preacher. I listen to him every night. He puts me to sleep every night. I am blessed beyond measure. Some widows never get to hear their husband again. I can turn mine on and hear it any time I want to. And that is a special blessing that the Lord has given to me. So he puts me to sleep every night, listening to him preach. And I'm so thankful for that. Most of the times in the morning, I listen to him too. But his last verse was Acts 542. And they lived in the temple and in every house. They ceased not to teach and preach Jesus. He said, I want to make Powell the place where we reach the whole world. I want to evangelize the whole world. And that's exactly what God allowed him to do. To establish all of these ministries that we have going on in England. And some of you from England are here tonight. What a blessing that is. And to start... We had our bus routes. I remember when we first went there, my husband said to me, honey, I'm going to visit all the bus routes. So he visited every single bus route, and he loved the buses. And the children in our church always loved my husband. I said to him one day, how come they love you and not love me? He said, they love you, honey. Well, he couldn't convince me of that, but they always, children always loved my husband. And the elderly always loved him. He had a special place in his heart. If he had someone like Dr. Robertson or Dr. Sales, he was going to do everything he could do to be a special blessing to them. You know, after that, you know, God called me to be my husband's help me. And when he came to me and said, I want to start college, we prayed and prayed about the name. He talked to Dr. Robertson about the name of the college. And they settled on Brown College. And he was very excited about the name of the college, but I never opposed anything that my husband wanted to do because I knew God had given him a special insight to what his life was to accomplish. And so he started Crown College, and I would have to tell you that Crown College has been one of the biggest blessings in our lives. To see young people stand up here and sing, and to hear men preach has been a tremendous to my heart. While I was talking to some of the graduates last night, I laughed. And that may sound simple to you, but that's the first time I've really laughed since my precious husband went home to be with the Lord. It was very special to me. What would he say to you? I'm not really sure, but I have a book of about 50 quotes that most of the college students read first to you tonight. Some of them are. Everything begins with God. The Christian life is a series of new beginnings. Our faith was once delivered and must be continued for in every generation. And he would say, take the highway. 
for the last six to eight weeks of my husband's life. He didn't move. He didn't speak. They had taken his mind. It was gone. And I begged God. I said, God, please, just let me hear him tell me he loves me. One more time, he couldn't. He didn't. People say, oh, they raised up in bed and they raised their hands and they saw Jesus coming and they saw the angels. I said, God, let me see something. So they said, well, God didn't. He just lied there in bed. And he gently took his last breath here and entered it into the kingdom of God. It was precious. He never got to tell him so much time that he loved me. But you know, God is so good. He wrote this book. I didn't know he had written it. He was something else. John chapter 17 is my favorite chapter in the Bible. And this is the last book that he wrote while he was still alive. We do have some that he written. We didn't know about there were one published in the future. But he wrote this book, and it's entitled Our Praying Savior. And perhaps you have a copy of it. After my husband went home to heaven, and he wasn't too. It says, Evelyn and I have been married for 57 years. And I said to her the other day, I love you more now than I have ever loved you. And I have always loved you since you were a young girl. He said, this is not true, but he said it. God let me marry the most beautiful girl in high school. And I want you to know that I still love you. That's how good our God is. He didn't say it. He wrote it in print where I could go back and read it. And many times, as I wanted to, I want to leave you this evening with a Bible verse that God has used in my heart so much. The Bible says in Revelation 14, 13, And I heard a voice from heaven say unto me, Right, blessed are the dead, which died in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, they, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow. Yeah. I think we have seen proof this way, that his works are following him. Of course, I miss him. I miss him immensely. And I don't remember. I know what you're going through. And also, unless you've lost half of your heart, you never know what a widow will go through. But I want you to know that being here in this meeting, Kendall, thank you for asking me to come. It has been such a special blessing. And all of you crown graduates, you're going to stand. I know you're going to stand because you're just as strong as my husband was. And he'll come back and launch you if you don't. <laughs> I love you. Thank you so very much.